Today's topic, uh, forgive the loaded title, but um, the, the context is the you know, tensions in treaty negotiations associated with, with DSI, with gene sequence information and other types of information associated with genetic resources. And really it's the risk that these tensions uh, present for upending research and innovation. And the, the, su the substance of the presentation and hopefully the take home messages you'll have um, are really what's at stake and what can the scientific community do to help resolve these tensions? And just for some context, as Wendy mentioned, we, we met uh, working with Wendy and Felix for, for just over a year on this synthetic biology uh, update uh, to a technical series. It, it was an update from a um, volume that came out in 2015. And it's, it's quite uh, incredible how much the international, how much the technology has evolved in, that, in, in those seven years but also the international regulatory landscape. And it, in the context of that study, we, um, we looked uh, at a number of different international uh, treaties and governance mechanisms, and this issue of access and benefit sharing um, came up repeatedly. And so we, we felt this would be a good topic to zoom in and uh, strip away the synthetic biology focus and really zoom in on, on, on DSI. And as you can see, and this is just, a, uh, just to give you a bird's eye view of some of the findings, um, we, we identify 20 different um, treaties or, or international mechanisms that, that currently regulate and, and, and have implications for the governance of DSI. Some of them are quite advanced. Uh, WHO, uh, CITES, the uh, Convention on Biological Diversity, for example, have dedicated programs uh, governing synthetic biology with implications for DSI. Others are just wading in uh, to those borders. But you can imagine that in a few years, it won't be 20 organizations. It'll be much, uh, it'll be many more. And, and that will have implications for your research uh, portfolio, no doubt. And the, the main focus, uh, the st study was commissioned by the Convention on Biological Diversity. Hopefully you're familiar with the Biodiversity, Biodiversity Convention with the Cartagena Protocol and the Nagoya Protocol. That was the focus of that, the main focus of that particular study. For today's purposes, we will be focusing just on the convention and its uh, Nagoya Protocol. So just, um, I appreciate that it's a multidisciplinary team online and in the room. Some people will have some familiarity with the topic, others will have none. And so I've tried to prepare, it really is an introduction, I'm not getting into too much technical detail, not too much nuance. Um, but by all means, we're able to, there'll be enough time uh, to, to visit issues if they arise. For those online, if you do have questions, um, pop them into the chat. We can, we can get to them at the end. Uh, and for those in the room, I ask that you hold on to your questions when, we, um, when we're ready to move on to the Q&A. So for those that aren't familiar with these treaties, the, the Convention on Biological Diversity, it was, um, first became effective in 1993. We, we now have over 20 years experience implementing both, well, implementing the CBD and just over five years experience implementing its Nagoya protocol. And the, the, it's important for those that aren't familiar with these instruments, it's important to know that the objectives um, of the CBD are conservation, sustainable use, and the fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources. And then the Nagoya Protocol focuses on that third objective and, and looks again at fair and equitable sharing of the benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources, including access uh, and, and transfer of relevant technologies. So um, hopefully that will speak to you given the, the organizational mission and vision, but I will we'll move on to look at the synergies in a moment. Um, what's often missed uh, or, or underappreciated is the context in which these, th this particular treaty was, was uh, approved. It was the early 90s. And as part of the Rio Earth Summit, there was a slew, there were a slew of international instruments focusing on issues of the environment, issues of climate change, issues of biodiversity protection, but at the same time, focusing also on economic development. And there was a really a seismic shift prior to this period the, the world's genetic resources, its biodiversity was really a, a global commons. It wasn't owned by any individual in, in any particular country. And then we moved into a system that acknowledged sovereign rights and the right to exploit and the intention to exploit for, 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 for economic development. So 
Um, it was a grand bargain of sorts between the North and the South. And this, this access and benefit sharing is a kind of trade-off. So biodiversity rich countries giving access to their genetic resources, but then benefiting from the, the technologies and the commercial applications that, that arise. That was the intention. Um, the, the actual triggers that are built into these treaties are utilization, it's research, it's innovation. So very much applicable to, to those of you, work, all of you working in the life sciences. And this, the consequence of, this, of these sovereign rights is really a bilateral system. So except for certain, um, for certain areas where there, there, is multilateral, there are multilateral arrangements for accessing genetic resources, we moved into a system of bilateral negotiation. And so this was very different for scientists who prior to this period um, were used to just, just sending, sending materials in the mail or seeing a particular variety growing in a field that they liked and just plucking it, taking it back to their lab or moving from one lab to, to another cross, cross, uh, internationally and taking specimens with them. Suddenly we're in an environment where the, the, the movement of those materials are regulated. And what we tend to see internationally is that there's varying degrees of, we have almost 30, 25 years experience implementing these treaties and there's still um, differences of, of exposure and understanding of what the implications are from a, from a research perspective. But the, for, but the, and one of the reasons I give that background is because for a lot of people, it's, it's pull out your hair material. When you encounter the Nagoya Protocol, you encounter the CBD, it's usually adding uh, transaction cost, regulatory burden, delaying your projects. But when you take a step back and understand the context in which these treaties were approved, which was really economic development, maybe you have a bit more sympathy for um, some of the unintended consequences of trying, of trying to achieve that. Um, then again, these two instruments, uh, here, what I've done is just pull out in, in blue, I won't go through them individually, but just pull out some provisions that, that hopefully um, you will see yourself mirrored in as an international research organization with capacity development, technology transfer embedded into your mission and vision. These treaties don't just govern access and benefit sharing, they also uh, govern uh, technical cooperation, technology transfer, uh, knowledge transfer, and uh, at, at public awareness and training related to these issues. So hopefully, as you see these clauses beyond just the access and benefit sharing provisions, you, you're, you're seeing the synergies and the relevance to ICGB's vision, mission and its uh, research portfolio. And I do have sympathy because for international organizations operating um, in multiple countries, it, that what they face is a, is a fragmented regulatory framework where every country is implementing in a slightly different way these access and benefit sharing laws. And sometimes the differences can be significant. And that's not necessarily apparent to a researcher um, who, who, who's quite far away from the regulatory environment. So before we go any further, let's, it's, 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 it's doing these kinds of presentations, it's easy to forget that for most people, digital sequence information doesn't mean anything. It's not a scientific term. It's a, it's a term that's um, evolved from the, the policy environment. It's a, it's a term, it's a placeholder term that policymakers have adopted to define the, what is yet to be defined. There is no consensus on what digital sequence information is, what its scope is. Um, so, but before I do that, let's, let's ask the question after 20 odd years of implementation, is this grand bargain working? And at the moment, the, it, you know, the indicators aren't looking good. Access is constrained. You know, the, the, the users of genetic resources are reporting difficulty accessing materials because of these regulatory barriers. At the same time, the countries that, that are the providers of the gen genetic resources are frustrated because they're not seeing the, the, this, the, this grand bargain. They're not seeing benefits boomeranging, boomeranging back to them. Um, they're not realizing the bioeconomic led development that they were anticipating would would follow the implementations of these treaties. So everybody's frustrated. It doesn't seem, it seems that the, these treaties are at a, at a bit of a crisis point. And that's um, evident in the, in the negotiations currently underway. And, you know, these tensions are in part reflected by the previous 10 year biodiversity strategy. Uh, you might be more familiar with the actual um, Archie targets. 
none of those targets were actually achieved. So the, there's, as we move into designing the next 10 year strategy, we're carrying, we're carrying a lot of baggage. And um, it's not just tensions around whether we're meeting biodiversity targets, it's tensions around the funding to actually, to actually implement um, the, the, the objectives to, 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 to achieve these targets around biodiversity and sustainable use. We're talking trillions of dollars and that, that money just hasn't materialized. So that's adding to the frustrations. And more recently in the, in the last four or five years, this, you know, this digital sequence information um, seems to be, the drumbeat gets louder and louder. It's become a real point of contention uh, as we, and, a, and a, almost a dangerous point of contention as we move into what should be finalizing the next 10 year biodiversity strategy. And is actually currently in doubt because of um, lack of consensus on a number of issues, including digital sequence information. So let's go and have a look. What is, what is this digital sequence information? So as I mentioned, it's a placeholder term. Um, it essentially is, the, it, it, it captures all of the omics. It's all of the, the, the data that uh, can be generated associated with the genetic resource. So arising either out of transcription or translation or metabolic processes. It goes beyond the omics to actually can also include the environment in which those materials are are found. And recently in 2020, um, it's confusing as well because different, different treaty four are used different terms. Some are, are using digital sequence information. Others have used genetic sequence information, which already implies a much more narrow scope. And yet others are using even more obtuse uh, terms uh, like in silico data. So there's, there's no clear arrangement and agreement on, on, on either terminology or scope. Fortunately, uh, an ad hoc technical um, advisory or ex expert group in 2020 bought, tried to bring some order to the chaos, and they did a couple of things. Firstly, they, they identified um, in, in it, it, an approach for, to ident for, for, so that we could have a, a common understanding on, on issues of scope, and they've adopted what you could call Russian dolls. So the most narrow scope, what they call this group one, is simply DNA and RNA. If you were to, if the international community were to adopt a broader scope, um, it would include that, but also proteins and epigenetic modifications. If you, if they were to broaden the scope again, it would include uh, macromolecules and, met and and metabolites. So, so that at least gives brings some order to the chaos, so we can talk about scope in a much more structured way. They also identified different uh, ter terms that have been historically used, um, and and map them to those three different categories while continuing to acknowledge the, at least the usefulness for now to, of, of digital sequence information as a placeholder term because there is no consensus. But hopefully this um, ordered approach, the Russian doll analogy gives you some, some understanding, but also appreciating that the implications for research will be quite different if it's a very narrow scope that only deals with nucleotides or whether it's a much broader scope, um, including macromolecules. From, from that, um, it should be evident for, for, for those scientists and certainly the bioinformaticians that this has significant implications for the public databases that scientists use on a day-to-day -day basis. And so the INSDC is, and, and the, the three databases that uh, comprise the INSDC that are synchronized globally, um, these, these are the, 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 uh, a common pool of data for which scientists use in their everyday practice. Through the accession numbers in those databases, there are linkages downstream to hundreds, if not thousands of other databases that store these other kinds of information, protein, macromolecule related, et cetera. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a, an understanding of this abstract. Uh, you know, when we're talking about digital sequence information, this is what we're actually talking about. And coming back to this, you know, is the grand bargain working? It's, it's, we've already identified some tensions and here to elaborate a little bit on the digital sequence information front, um, we can, the, the, there are tensions because this information is publicly available, downloadable through databases um, without having to use a material transfer agreement, without having to negotiate prior informed consent and mutually agreed terms, which is the case if you're trying to access genetic resources. So for, for, for many, 
critics of the system, they, they see this as a backdoor, that these, these, this, this data commons that, we, that we've created in, in the last 20, 30 years is a backdoor, is providing backdoor access and, and thereby short-circuiting the benefit-sharing side of the, of, the, of the grand bargain. And we can see this in, um, in, in uh, peer-reviewed academic journals that talk about digital piracy um, and, and trying to, to deconstruct the problem and, and the gaps that the, unfortunately these international treaties weren't developed um, with these technical developments in mind and also more bombastic uh, criticisms. Um, but you can see that there's a diversity of views that, that abound and it's very relevant because from the scientific community, um, no one wants to be a bio pirate. We all want to do the right thing. And so understanding that these tensions exist is important. Um, here, we've, we, there's, there's multitudes of views. Uh, there are countries that don't consider that DSI should be part of the scope of, of the CBD and the Nagoya Protocol. There are others that are undecided. Um, there's also scientific perspectives. And, and here, um, the, the DSMZ Leibniz Institute from Germany has been quite vocal in this space. Uh, they published a white paper um, trying to find, try, trying to bring an evidence base into the discussion and trying to um, identify areas where there might be compromise. And with the particular focus being, okay, let's accept, um, we, we understand that there's frustration around benefit sharing. How can we address this in a way that doesn't severely disrupt or hinder open access and, and innovation processes that rely on, on this data commons? Um, likewise, uh, I, what I thought was quite a powerful um, open letter at the time, it was released in 2019, I recall. Um, and this was, this was by researchers from both the private uh, industry and also public research organizations coming together and really talking about the need to preserve, uh, not, not, not um, accepting that there are challenges around benefit sharing, but, but cautioning um, the, some of the policy solutions to address those problems to, to continue to preserve the benefits that exist from open access. So a diversity of views. Then with that context, we can finally dive a little bit into the, the actual tensions. And so um, this issue first arose in the context of the uh, CBD and its Nagoya protocol. Um, it came to a fore in the COP meeting, uh, COP 13 in 2016, um, the decision, because it was such a contentious issue, the parties agreed to, to, to set up a process over two years to further explore this issue, to convene a, a, a technical advisory committee of experts, to do scoping studies, to invite submissions from parties to understand well, what, is it, what are the positions, what, what's really the issue. Uh, then in 2018, uh, the parties still weren't able to come to agreement and they acknowledged that because there is this divergence of views, um, they would initiate a science policy process to continue to delve deeper, to commission more studies focusing on different aspects of the, of the issue, um, to, to ideally see if some kind of compromise could be reached at the next COP meeting, which was meant to uh, have occurred in 2020, but because of COVID, has been, has been delayed and continues to be delayed. Um, if all goes well, it will take place this year around March or April, um, but there's, there's every possibility given the current circumstances that it may need to be delayed again. In some ways, those delays may actually be helpful. It may be providing more of a, more oxygen into the discussion. Um, hopefully, it, it, may, it may also just be resulting in, in hardened and crystallized positions. Um, it's hard to tell, but what's, what is very clear is that this continues to be a contentious issue, a, a very passionate issue. Um, and coming up to the COP15, it's, um, it's a fault line. And it's the, it's the kind of issue that if there is no consensus on this issue, what's at risk from a um, international governance perspective is that we don't have the next 10 year policy to, to guide us uh, on biodiversity protection, sustainable use and access and benefit sharing. And that would be a multilateral failure, particularly considering how uh, that some of the wins that, that we've managed to achieve, particularly on, on climate change and other, other issues related to biodiversity. So that's what's at stake from a treaty perspective. 
And this open-ended working group three meeting uh, that takes place in just a few weeks, uh, mid mid uh, March, um, will will be the next opportunity that parties have to come together and delve into this is issue a little bit deeper. But COP15 is just around the corner, and everybody involved in this process is is you know holding their breath to see um, will will some kind of impasse be achieved? Will there be some kind of um, consensus on a, on a way forward that doesn't interfere with the adoption of the global biodiversity framework, this 10 years uh, strategy. And also part of that strategy, the next, well, or the first um, long-term strategic framework for capacity development and support to implement the global biodiversity strategy. So these are two important, um, two important frameworks or, or strategies that, that, are, that are, if everything goes well, will be implemented. And if everything doesn't go well with DSI could, um, could face a, a large degree of uncertainty. So hopefully that gives you some idea of the, of the tensions and what's at stake. So um, we mentioned, you know, so that's what's happening under the, the, bio, the COP15 and, and, the, and the, the, the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Nagoya Protocol. But this issue is actually being considered in a number of different international fora. So as we you know, saw at the beginning with synthetic biology, there's lots of different international um, governance frameworks that might apply. For DSI, it's at the moment three, three different additional treaty frameworks that are looking at uh, digital sequence information from the context of, of indigenous people and local communities at WIPO and, and accessing their traditional knowledge and, and focal. Um, also from, from WHO looking at DSI and, and um, multilateral, the potential for multilateral mechanisms for, for accessing uh, through their uh, pandemic influenza preparedness framework. Um, and also the, the International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, which is another specialized instrument which has a multilateral approach to accessing materials through a, a standard SMTA. Um, then finally, there's a, the, the, the way the CBD works is it operates, uh, there are certain things that are not within scope. And so uh, ma genetic materials that are in international waters are not within the scope of the CBD, which is why a lot of um, bioprospecting projects take place in international waters. And now there's a, there's a negotiation underway under the UN law of the sea to start regulating this space and looking at areas beyond national jurisdiction in marine environments. So um, as you can see, it's, 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 it, it gets complex and there is a possibility that each one of these treaties could take a different approach. There's no guarantee that there will be any kind of uniform approach. And so that, for a researcher whose, whose activities may span marine uh, genetic resources, plant genetic resources, or the, you know, the microbiome of plant genetic resources, that, that they, or each one of those um, different materials could fall under different regimes. And so this is, this is a real threat to the, to the scientific community. And one of the reasons why it's important for the scientific community to be aware um, and, and to, to make sure that their views and voice uh, heard in these international discussions. That's the worst case scenario. Obviously, the best case scenario and, and the scenario that we're rooting for is that there is uniformity, that a, a system is implemented, that the complexity is so great and the cost and the inefficiencies of having uh, disparate systems is so great that, it, that some kind of uniformity is implemented um, and, and is, is therefore more likely to actually achieve uh, the objectives that it sets out to, to achieve. Okay, so that, um, that's the, they're the policy tensions. Here, we don't have enough time today to go into detail, but um, just to, to open the window into where the discussions are currently at, uh, as of, I think, April last year, the, in, in the, the same way that in 2020, there was some um, progress, at least in, in these Russian dolls, um, in, in terminology and scope, so that the, there was a, a common framework where um, no matter where you were sitting in the debate, you, you could converse and debate and, and be talking about the same thing, at least when it came to terminology and scope. As of April last year, the Secretariat uh, of the Convention on Biological Diversity conveniently put together a um, mapped different options that were on the table. So, you know, these come from different academic papers, some of them quite dense, and really distilled down to um, five options with some sub options. And now there's an additional option. We're not going to, we don't have enough time to go through all the options, but I just, 
you know, I, I, I just want to um, let you know that the, the different options have, have different implications for um, scientific research and innovation. You know, in a, possibly the most disruptive would be if the status quo were to persist. And the status quo is that right now, some countries don't regulate DSI. Other countries, in, in, the, in the absence of any kind of international consensus, are starting to regulate DSI in, in disparate manners, with more countries likely to start enacting national level legislation if there is no consensus internationally. So the status quo is fragmented, a fragmented complex regulatory environment. And that would, if um, that persists, it will be quite disruptive. Another, another potentially disruptive option would be if DSI is fully integrated, if, if it actually is given the same status as genetic resources, the implication is that you would need to, apply, to, to have prior informed consent and mutually agreed terms on a bilateral basis every time you use a country's um, digital sequence information. Obviously, the transaction costs for, for bioinformatics that uses you know, thousands or hundreds of thousands of sequences at a time, um, the implications are quite significant. So that, that DSI fully integrated option is, is also quite disruptive to research and innovation. Some of the going down the list, um, you know, there are some innovative ideas out there. People have seen what, that Creative Commons has actually um, made it a lot easier to access and disseminate materials. And, and there's people are suggesting, well, could, couldn't we develop a standard licensing system for, for DSI? So that's one area that's being looked at. Um, but it, and it's interesting and it deserves uh, to be explored. But we also know that from a licensing perspective, even Creative Commons, even, even for its simplicity, there are compatibility issues and not all materials that have a Creative Commons license are compatible. And so a licensing system that has lots of variation or even a small amount of variation puts the onus on you, the researcher, to make sure that, you know, to understand what the terms are that you're accessing materials on, what those um, materials are, and how, how those materials might be interoperable or not with other material or, or how that sequence data might be interoperable or not with other um, sequence data. And so there are pros and cons with a licensing approach. And then there are at the, you know, just zooming quickly to um, this, for example, um, uh, 3.2, other payments and contributions. So some of these mechanisms are envisioned to be um, in some way associated. So possibly a, a levy being applied at the, at the database interface or a levy being applied on reagents that are used to, to generate uh, and use uh, DSI. Um, and others are completely divorced from the actual experience of research and are being proposed as some kind of, you know, uh, ascent in the dollar biodiversity tax aimed at consumers. So there's lots of different ideas on the table, it's, which, is, which is good that, that the conversations that have advanced to creative thinking, but each of these options may have unintended consequences for research and innovation. And, and here the, the risk that it is that in the rush to, to reach some kind of compromise and consensus, an option is, is adopted or, or a path um, is, you know, we start going down a path that, that may have unintended consequences for research and innovation. And so that's why it's important to really um, go further and start fleshing out these options and evaluating them from the perspective of, of researchers. Okay, so we see that this, um, Hopefully it's apparent to you that this has significant implications. All of these options um, have potentially significant implications for open access research and innovation, uh, which, which is counterintuitive because what, if anything, what we've seen is a trend towards open in the last 10 to 20 years and not just open for the sake of scientific um, research integrity and ethics, um, open from the perspective of even countries' own science and innovation policies, wanting to, wanting to um, leverage open data to, to facilitate collaborative research approaches and to turbocharge their own uh, national uh, innovation programs. And so significant, significant implications, some more uh, disruptive than, than others. And so, you know, it, the heart of this issue is really what's at stake. We have 40 year, a 40 year history of open access that, that now is coming, being called into question. And we, we, um, we won't go through all the milestones. I'm sure you're quite familiar with some of them, but the, it, it's worth noting that, you know, there are three different lineages. 
of initially um, open source software and the, the interesting licensing models that came, came out of open source software. Then we also had open sequence data um, and the policies that were adopted early on in the human uh, uh, genome project that, that, that set the standard for making data open and, and available to all other scientists within, in a timely manner. Likewise, there's, there's um, it, its own niche of open access in a publishing context. Um, maybe not the model we want to replicate because open access publishing is a rainbow of different types of open access. It's hard, there is no one open access. Uh, it's a spectrum of open access. And, and, and then what we're seeing now is that these um, different lineages, they're converging. People aren't really talking about open access, open source, they're, they're talking about open science and we're seeing the emergence of a much more um, standardized and, and, and uh, a, a broader scope of, of um, openness under the umbrella of open science. And we know that um, it's not just a 40 year history of open access in all of these contexts. We can look at it specifically in the context of sequence data. We know that the scientific community has a long history of sharing digital sequence information. And here we have uh, just some, some data from uh, EMBL, one of the INSDC databases. And we, we see that as the cost of sequencing has gone down, uh, the, the actual um, number of sequences that are in these databases have, have you know, but the, the cost has been ex decreasing exponentially and the, the volume of sequences that are available has been increasing exponentially. And so, you know, obviously the reliance of modern, the, 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 the growing reliance of research on, uh, these public databases and, and these open sequences. We, we see this, um, again, looking at the EMBL, uh, the, here just showing you a picture of, in a, in a particular um, uh, project, uh, Elixir, I, 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 if I recall correctly, is a, a um, focuses on the sharing of human genome data. And, and this, this just gives you an exchange of, uh, an, a, 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 an idea of how data exchange is, is occurring, how, um, how interconnected it is and how frictionless and, and how that's enabled by the current frictionless state that exists. And then secondly, um, EMBL, and, and we're seeing um, how they're exchanging data with external resources. So that this interdependence that exists that um, might not be the case if there was not a frictionless environment. Would we have, you know, we're, we're all learning from, from we're all taking lessons from, from the COVID pandemic. Would we actually have the vaccines that we've been able to roll out in record time if we didn't have these, this data commons? Um, if we hadn't spent the last 20, 30 years growing this data commons and creating the standards that allow research labs all around the world to, to, to dial in, download, and, and be speaking the same language. It's, and, and I'm sure um, some, of, some of you in, in, in the audience will have a, a much more granular view and opinion on that than, than I might. But one, one thing that's certain is looking at the, the patents for the mRNA vaccine, um, you, they don't actually quote uh, the SARS-CoV-2 sequence. The, 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 what the patent is claiming or citing is really um, uh, beta coronavirus se sequences generated uh, much earlier. And so these, even these vaccines are relying, relying on, the, on the vast uh, data commons that, that came before it. Then um, just at a glance, just taking you through some of the milestones that are quite relevant to show you how they uh, then converge on open science. And here, I, I just wanted to really, again, draw to your attention this, this, um, this almost cognitive dissonance where, where on the one hand, um, there's, there's a, a, the, the, the possibility that, that data, sequence data will be controlled and regulated. And then on the other hand, the, the real emergence of, of open science, um, including the recently adopted open uh, science recommendation by UNESCO members. And there's a 98% overlap between CBD uh, parties, countries that are, that are mem uh, signatory parties and have implemented the CBD and UNESCO. And yet we still have this, um, on the one hand, uh, unanimous support for, for, for the recommendations on open science, which stress the importance of, of making data not just um, open, but inclusive, uh, and, and um, the importance of, of, of good governance and, and, and data stewardship. 
and then the the possibility of on the on the other hand um, facing the, the the prospect of of that very same data being regulated and and um, in, increase uh, friction to to access and use. Um, when we look at that the digital sequence information, some of the I mean, if we if we were to describe the defining characteristics, uh, we'd say, well, look, it's anonymous access. Um, so users are generally able to use it without registration. It's free. There's currently no charge. And and I mention these because depending on the options, different options have different implications for these um, constitutive characteristics. It's technically interoperable, so it can be used in in different fields of of um, life sciences. It's legally interoperable because of near uniform or and, and permissive terms, with notable exceptions, particularly around human genome data. Um, we, we know that certain databases like GSAID, um, they, they're a type of open access, but they have obligations on users as well that, that are not the case for those accessing um, sequences through the INSDC databases. And likewise, um, certain national laws that may be regulated. So um, there are exceptions to this legally interoperable, but it's this technical and legal interoperability that more or less creates frictionless use. And, you as, and, and the average researcher, for the average researcher, it's as if the material doesn't have any legal obligations or restrictions. There's not even a, an easy way, the, 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 in the INSDC databases, there's no information. There's no, there's, there, there are no fields for attaching licensing information. So it's not even possible for a researcher without actually going and doing research at, of, of a country's regulatory system to understand if there, if there are um, terms and conditions attached to the use of that particular material in a, in a particular way or, or purpose. So, uh, and then the last one was simply the, the tracking and tracing. You know, there is currently no tracking and tracing. And so all of these um, characteristics that define open access in a, in a digital sequence, in a, in a DSI co context, um, which are taken for granted, could be affected some of these uh, with, with different implications. Perhaps it is possible to remove uh, anonymous access and without breaking what we currently understand to be open access. Uh, maybe maybe the, there could be tolerance for a fee for some users, but it would, it would fundamentally change open access as, as we know it if we start introducing fees for information that otherwise was, was freely available. Okay, so we don't have a lot of time left. Um, now we're moving on to, you know, the, the hopefully the, the, the take home messages. So what can we do? There's, there is this international, okay, there's the, there are international treaty processes. Um, there, there, are, there are scientific experts involved um, in, in those expert working groups. There are um, scientific perspectives being presented, um, but what, you know, what can we do? As international research organizations and, and scientists working in this space, and so there's a, there's a few things just to, to share with you, I guess, you know, starting with raising awareness. I think there's often an under awareness of um, science, re the regulatory environment that, that science operates in. And so, you know, beginning um, familiarizing yourself, understanding these, that these issues exist and understanding the nuances of the tensions. So yes, um, regulatory burden is, is, is frustrating, but no one wants to be a bio pirate and we all wish and, and the ultimate objective is economic development. So we, we have sympathy with, with those that, that want to see more out of benefit sharing and, and, and as a result, want to seek to, to introduce new kind of controls that, that don't currently exist. Um, likewise, not, not just having, um, not just talking about technology transfer and capacity development in an abstract sense, it's in our mission. So surely everything we do is tech transfer and capacity development. It, it might be the case, but really, are you measuring that? Are you evaluating how effective it is? Um, is it fit for purpose? These are all things that I, I think international organizations should be asking themselves, given not just the tensions around fair and equitable benefit sharing that we know exist in the life sciences context, um, but the, the example that we have about uh, vaccine equity and the, and the the, the discussions that you know we're, we're seeing entering the, the mainstream, we, we're hearing on the news. Um, we we can also have a have a a better understanding now that now that there is more widespread understanding. I think we um, it gives us an opportunity to really with fresh eyes look at tech transfer and capacity development and, and ask if it's fit for purpose. Um, I mentioned indicators and, and communication. 
you know, I, most, most organizations are talking, at, at least mapping the SDGs that are relevant to what they do. Some are, are more advanced than others in terms of rolling out indicators, but in eight, eight years from now, when the SDGs finish, hopefully um, organizations have more than just anecdotes about how they implemented one or other SDG and they're able to back that up with, with concrete evidence. And if you don't have indicators, if you don't have a monitoring framework in place, um, then, then, then all, all it will be are anecdotes. Likewise, um, I, I mentioned, you know, really, how can we strengthen capacity development and technology transfer? So what, one is mainstreaming it into project planning, right? So every project, uh, and, and we see some donors actually require this. We, we, we know that if you're, if you're doing a Horizon 20 or her, her, you, her, Europe Horizon application, um, that they systematically ask about ABS compliance issues. Uh, you know, if you're doing a Gates application, they systematically ask about global access and, and, and path to market scaling, et cetera. So um, doing it not because a donor is requiring it, but, but really integrating it um, into your research planning as an institutional um, best practice. And then that's it. That's at the project level, but then we also see these best practice examples of, of dedicated projects to capacity development. I'm, I'm, I'm um, aware of this Cabana project, which does capacity building in bioinformatics in uh, Latin America. I'm sure that it, uh, ICGB has similar projects in place. Um, so you may you may also be saying, oh, well, we, we have projects that, that achieve similar aims. So if you do, hopefully you are, you're mining those projects for metrics and you're being very vocal about those projects and holding them up as best practice examples for others to, to follow. Um, likewise, the, I, I mentioned the, the long-term uh, um, uh, strategy for, for capacity development to implement the global biodiversity framework, which is one, one part of the GBF. Um, so looking at what, what is the CBD doing, for example, and how can we, where is that? Where are there synergies with the programs that we have? And here you might be familiar with some of the um, CBD initiatives around the, the BioBridge initiative, um, the, the Sustainable Ocean initiative, et cetera. But, but looking at what, what's already out there and, and seeing are there synergies, should we be um, more closely involved? And then other approaches you might be aware of, there's a, a number of competitions that, that have been evolving that are, that are specifically targeting pro-development outcomes, so SDG-related outcomes, and trying to connect upstream research with funding. And that these competitions are actually quite a good way to increase awareness, um, not just around ABS issues, but around tech transfer and, and commercialization generally. So just some examples. Um, and then likewise, just to draw to your attention, the, this ad hoc expert um, technical group I mentioned made some recommendations around how capacity building in a specific DSI context could be strengthened. And so these are areas um, that are, if you're, if you're looking at, at uh, capacity building through a DSI lens, this would be a good first stop to be figuring out, okay, what are we doing that ticks uh, these boxes or, or speaks to these recommendations? And so mindful of time, I'll, I'll just wrap up now um, with a couple of closing thoughts. So, you know, we have a new normal. We, we won't, we, post COVID, uh, we, we, I don't think we'll go back to business as usual. Um, and, and so, you know, if, if, you have, if you have skin in the game, you know, his, the, the question to ask is, you know, would your, how would your research be affected if, if access and use of DSI were to be regulated in some way? If the status quo that we currently have were to change, how would it affect you as a, as a researcher? Then secondly, what, what are the lessons that we can learn um, from the COVID-19 pandemic, you know, seeing, seeing these um, vaccine inequity play out in real time and giving context to these claims of, and frustrations around fair and equitable benefit sharing. And then, you know, what, knowing what we know, what, does, what should capacity building, technical cooperation and tech transfer look like post, you know, once this GBF framework is approved and, and embedded into that is a long-term strategy on capacity building. Um, what does it look like post-COVID when we go back to normal? Will, will we see more COVAX-like mechanisms that are facilitating procurement? Will we see continued um, discussion at the uh, WTO around IP waivers, uh, et cetera? Um, and, and, and 
it feels like the end of the SDGs are far away, but they're not. It's uh, it, the, the SDGs will finish at the end of this decade. So what does t tech transfer and capacity building, you know, how do we future proof it so that um, we're not just waiting for the next um, set of development goals to come along to, to, to map to and align to. So that, that draws to a close the presentation. Hopefully I, I've tried to keep it at a, at a, not getting too bogged down in technical detail. So some of the nuance is lost, but um, if you weren't familiar with these issues previously, I hope that it, it's given you some familiarity um, with the links in the, in, 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 uh, in, in the, in the slides, um, sources for you to, to dig further. And with that, I'll say thank you and uh, open to any questions that people might have.